All right. We're live on Facebook. So Lisa, you're going to go first. And then okay. um, what I have to do is Angel, you're going to, when we come back for the break, you're going to ask Lisa a question. Lisa, hold, you'll hold on during Angel's interview and ask Angel a question. Cause I think you guys are going to have a lot in common, a lot to talk about too. So awesome. it's kind of fun when everybody interacts, it makes for interesting, interesting podcast radio. So fantastic. It's time to rock your midlife with Dr. Ellen Albertson. Are you ready to get real breakthrough? and learn how to make your midlife the best time of your life? Take on those life challenges and turn them into opportunities? Let's rock, here's Dr. Ellen. Hey everybody, Dr. Ellen here, the Midlife Whisperer. I am thrilled that you are joining us today because we have got a hot show. I am so in love with my two guests. I've known them both for quite a while. They are both podcast professionals. They've got amazing stories and info to share with you. And today's show is all about healing. So our guests are going to inspire you to feel hopeful wherever you are about your future. And they're going to empower you to make changes that will transform you. You know, I've been thinking a lot about healing. If you've been following me, I was diagnosed with breast cancer about two weeks ago. So I am definitely on my healing journey um, and really looking at this as a way to empower myself, to bring my body back in balance, to hopefully inspire other women to get that mammogram as well as, you know, to really um, embrace where you're at, wherever you are, whatever you are dealing with. Because, you know, healing, we have a lot of um, crises at midlife, right? We're going through a lot of things. And this process of healing is this incredible opportunity to hit reset, like this was like surprise to me. So it's caused me to sort of reevaluate, to hit reset, to kind of reconstruct, realign, and, you know, and rebalance ourselves. And I think most important for me is really remember that everything in your life is happening for a reason and a purpose. And the universe has your back, even when life seems too difficult to handle. And you're like, why? Especially, you know, after COVID, after everything going on in the world, you sometimes are in this existentialist crisis of, I can't handle this and why this is happening. But it's this opportunity to move from strength to strength, to rise above and use that opportunity to transform. And, you know, in midlife, it's so interesting. I'm, I'm so much about, if you've been listening to the show, about rising and rebranding midlife. Because when you Google midlife, what you get is crisis. Crisis and midlife are conjoined. You put it in the thesaurus and you get the wrong side of 40. And you know, yes, there's a dip in midlife and it's very interesting. We're gonna be talking with uh, Lisa to hear in a moment about this planet called Chiron. Because Chiron comes around every 50 or so years, right at the time that we're starting to have the, you know, quote unquote midlife crisis. Um, and it really needs rebranding. It's really a time to take a look at what's working in our life, what's not working, make some changes. But it's definitely every time a planet comes around, there's a lot of questioning or a lot of revisiting and a lot of um, powerful, important things that you can do to really make your second adult or the rest of your life amazing. So it's interesting when you think about where midlife women are at with Chiron, some of us are in the Chiron return in Aries, which is right where Chiron is right now. Chiron's in Aries and Chiron spends more time in Aries and also Pisces. So we've got Chiron in Aries, basically um, Aries is between April, 1968 to June, 1976. So you are a woman who's got Chiron in Aries if you fall in there. And that means you're really looking at healing your value and self-worth. And with Pisces, which is where I'm at, it's 1960 to March, 1968, this really healing around self-care, um, this idea of always putting others first. And it seems to be a common theme with a lot of us these days. So we're gonna be talking about that and how you can heal those core wounds that you might be experiencing. And we're also gonna be talking about healing wounds around money because we have relationships with people and we all have a relationship with money and Angel Hartwell, our second guest today is gonna to really help us to heal our issues with wealth and with money. You know, and I'm finding the things that I'm really using a lot in my life, the tools for healing really are first of all, self-awareness, just to become aware that, hmm, Something's a little off right now. Maybe my body's not feeling in it. Maybe my relationships aren't working. 
maybe, you know, my mind and my thoughts aren't where I'd like them to be. Maybe I need to do some emotional healing. So start to become aware of where you are at and where you need to put energy and healing and where these opportunities of transformation are. Because when you find what needs to be healed, that's really where the transformation is happening, which is so exciting. And also self-acceptance instead of fighting it. And I'm going to, you know, I'm not into this like F cancer and fight cancer. I'm much more about accepting, understanding what I have to learn spiritually, how this is going to help me move forward with my life, how I bring my body back in balance, how I can support myself with both conventional therapies as well as uh, um, supportive, integrative health. So the self-awareness, self-acceptance, and finally, of course, self-love, which I talk a lot about self-love, self-compassion, self-care, all of those words around not saying, why is this happening to me? Criticizing yourself because maybe your lifestyle hasn't been where it needs to be, or you're in a relationship that you're beating yourself up about because it's not working, but loving and accepting yourself and giving yourself compassion for wherever you find yourself. Self-compassion is all about treating yourself the way you would a good friend. And I know my own life, self-love, self-compassion, self-care have been really my most powerful tools for transformation. So I wanna just share a quick process and then we'll bring on our first guest, uh, Lisa to here. So the first thing you wanna do is shift your mindset. If you're, if you're finding, you know, I need to do some healing, start with remembering that wherever you are, you are enough. You are smart enough. Mm -hmm. You have enough resources. You are good enough. All of those things. And remembering that everything is really going to be all right, that everything is working for our highest good, you know, make a decision or set an intention to change your story, you know, be a warrior, warrior, not a worrier. I'll say that again, be a warrior, get out there on your yoga mat and like strike a pose because, you know, worrying is like praying for what you don't want to happen. Get control of your story, get control of your mind and your mindset. That's number one. Next, create a plan and a strategy, you know, ask what is needed for me to heal? Like, what do I need to shift and change in my life? And, you know, get quiet and, and notice what shows up for you, um, then figure out your why, you know, you'll always have to, that to refer back to when you're on this healing path, what's your why? Why do you want to heal? Why do you want to transform? So ask that why it's very powerful. And after you do those three things, take a look at your habits, right? Look at forming healthier habits, whether that is habits with your lifestyle, changing your diet, movement, getting more rest, doing all the self-care things, changing your thoughts and your beliefs, working on giving yourself the emotional support you need, working on your spirituality, but changing your thoughts. So that, I'm sorry, changing your habits. It takes some time to change habits to really make that shift as you're going through your healing journey. And number five is find some support. There are so many amazing people to support you, coaches, therapists, support groups, whatever you're going through, you're not the first person to go through this. You're not the first person to have these emotions, these thoughts, these challenges, find some support. And then finally, you know, what I'm leaning into so much these days is prayer and meditation, block out time, even if it's just five minutes. First thing in the morning I find is the best thing, like to set some intentions, to connect with the source, spirit, God, whatever you call it, and ask for some, you know, some help from the divine within and without and notice what shows up for you. So I hope that you will take those to mind and know that I am here. If you want to reach out to me, you can always grab me at the midlifewhisperer.com. That's the midlifewhisperer.com. I've worked with hundreds of midlife women and I'm here to help you heal and transform. So let's get into the juicy part of the show. We are going to bring in on our first guest. She is Lisa Tahir and she is author of The Chiron Effect. For those of you who are watching, this is this beautiful book, which I, Lisa, I am loving it. Um, and we actually met about two years ago. I was doing a summit called Rock Your Midlife. And Lisa was a guest on my summit. And then I was a guest on her radio show. She has a fabulous podcast called All Things Therapy. She is a licensed social worker. She has a private practice in Los Angeles and New Orleans. She is a badass. I would say follow her on Instagram if you want to see her doing her like weightlifting, Iron Woman stuff. She is just so inspiring. She is passionately committed to working with people to help them heal through all the senses of the body by utilizing intuition, 
therapy, energy healing, meditation, Reiki healing, crystal healing, nutrition, sound frequencies, yoga, exercise, her podcast, writing and teaching. Welcome to the show, Lisa. So awesome to have you here. Dr. Ellen, it's so wonderful to be with you today. And I want to start with just the way that you are positioning yourself in relationship to being told that there's a breast cancer diagnosis and the way that you're holding yourself in the belief of your full healing through traditional and alternative modalities and therapies. I support you 100%. And I just, I just couldn't begin our time together without acknowledging the beautiful ways that you spoke about this unexpected change in your life and the way that you are positioning yourself mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. It's beautiful. Well, thank you, Lisa. Um, yeah, I feel fantastic, you know, yeah. and I'm, and I'm going to really hold on to that and see where it takes me. So, so we will see, but let's talk about you and your amazing book, which has been, I had a huge aha moment. Like I was reading your book and I finally understood like, what's the difference between, um, body, spirit, and soul, spirit, soul piece. I always had a little, little trouble with that, but I was reading it and it really, it hit me. So it's just such a beautiful work. Why did you write the book? Tell us the story of how, why you wrote it and how long it took. I, I wrote my book, The Chiron Effect, because even after being a licensed therapist for over 20 years, being in therapy myself for numerous years, I still felt, Dr. Ellen, like there was something, why wasn't I as happy as I believed I could be um, and wanted to be. And I turned to meditation and I literally heard when I asked the universe, what's going on here? How can I help myself and my clients like really authentically feel happier more often than not outside of just peak experiences that we have doing something fun on vacation or gathered with friends, more of a consistent, permanent sense of peace and well-being, like help me with this. And I literally heard Chiron in, in my heart, in my mind. And at first I really wasn't that enthused because my reference of Chiron was from grad school, Carl Jung's work with the collective unconscious, the archetypes, Chiron. And I just ignored it to be totally honest. And over the next few weeks, it kept coming up, Chiron, Chiron, Chiron. And you know, when the universe is prodding at you, I finally was like, oh, okay, let me just Google this. And I started to find out so interestingly that Chiron is in astronomy, a minor planet and comet that was discovered in 1977. And it orbits between Saturn and Uranus in our solar system and was named Chiron after the Greek centaur of mythology, the founding father of the healing arts, Chiron. And then that led me down the rabbit hole of in our astrological birth chart, Chiron is a placement in Aries, Gemini, Scorpio, Pisces, just like you know your sun sign, your rising, your moon, Chiron is in an astrological sign and house. And I started to just get curious about what this reveals about us. And it reveals an area on a spectrum between vulnerability and core wounding. And we have a relationship to this part of ourselves, be it our self-esteem, being outwardly successful, even financially lucrative, yet feeling like you're never enough. And that disconnection is what causes us to feel an imbalance inside of ourselves. That's often not apparent to anyone else but us, but it can be debilitating and certainly cause emotional disturbances, health issues, and all kinds of things. So I spent about four years researching and writing to really understand the 12 placements of Chiron in each astrological sign. And I hope that it helps people really be able to feel the happiness they want to feel more easily. Yeah, it's a very interesting how we're we're developing, we're finding new planets, and you've actually started this whole area called psychoastrology, where you're utilizing astrology to help with psychotherapy. Can you explain how you came up with that and how people can utilize their birth chart to help them with their uh, spiritual psycho healing? 
Sure. I, I see like a lot of people, astrology is a beautiful symbolic language. It's so complex and I don't attempt to call myself an astrologer because I come from this as a professional psychotherapist from the wheelhouse of personal transformation. And so I overlay Chiron, particularly psychoastrology is simply where your birth chart astrology meets your personal psychology. And for me, I love inventing things. I have a U.S. patent. So for me, it was just really cool and fun to trademark a word that that has to do with this intersection of this blueprint of when we were born, where stars and planets were positioned and that propensity for us to live into those attributes or not. I believe we have personal responsibility and free choice. You know, we're not dictated by, by something given to us or told, be it your astrological placements or anything else in your life. So the remediation to heal our vulnerability and wounding really is by stepping into your personal power to take responsibility for whatever it is you've experienced and change those patterns. Yeah, it's p- powerful stuff. I know for me, Chiron is so important because my Chiron and my Jupiter are conjunct. Okay. So I have both of them in Pisces. So I know that being a healer and doing healing work myself is huge. So let's talk a little bit about um, core wounds. So what exactly are core wounds and have other people spoken about that or use other terms that people might recognize about this core wounding? Core wounding is what I was speaking about is on a spectrum for us that for some of you watching and listening, this might just be an area of vulnerability, kind of like an ouch where, um, you know, it's not particularly a deep pain point, but for others of us that have experienced childhood trauma, neglect and abuse, there are these core wounds left, especially to the younger parts of ourselves. And it can cause us to want to protect those areas of vulnerability, those areas of wounding and develop even a a profession to never have to feel them again. And yet when we do this at some point, it just kind of runs out of steam. You know, when you hide and protect something, eventually it comes through because every part of ourselves wants full expression in this life that we're here to live. And so in my book, I help you understand by creating the container for change in the beginning chapters where we are a vessel. And I invite you to get a candle, a journal. I walk you through some of my memories to help you tap into your own childhood memories to begin to set the stage of reviewing your life through a lens of compassion, of deep empathy, and self-forgiveness when needed, because it's the unforgiveness we harbor towards ourselves that causes experiences to stay painful even years after they've even happened. And so it's this really like, you know, walking you down the path together through your own memories and, and such so that you can heal yourself and not feel so afraid of the things that have been painful for you. So how do we go about forgiving ourselves? I know a lot of people are listening and that sounds really nice, but they have no idea how to forgive themselves and others. I think we hold on to so much of our resentment. And again, that self-critic, how can people let go of that and start to forgive themselves so that they can start to heal these core wounds? Sure, Dr. Ellen, I speak about forgiveness being progressively actioned as a process that forgiveness, it it very well may be in simple situations, like I forgive you and this is done. But I think more often for the more complex things that we encounter in our lives, forgiveness is progressive and we come to it over and over again in a circular pattern, much like peeling the layers of an onion and personal transformation and self-discovery. And it's about with the awareness we have to be able to understand why we acted from that place and positioning within ourselves. And it's, it's always based in some sort of fear, fear that you're going to be hurt, fear that you need to protect yourself, fear that there's not enough. And it's by really being able to be with those parts progressively that we're able to expand into the awareness of, you know, I, even if I didn't do the best that I could in that moment, life is going to give us hundreds, if not thousands of more opportunities to practice again, the same experience. So there's unlimited potentials of us being able to show up differently for ourselves and others and being able to forgive 
in a coaching and loving way versus that punitive and angry way towards yourself is what's going to help you feel that spaciousness and over time be able to give it to others authentically. Yeah, that's powerful. Not to, again, that self-critic of beating yourself up, but to open up and allow yourself to feel. I, I really like the Hanapano Pano prayer, which is Absolutely. simply, um, you know, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I forgive you. I love you. It's got different versions of it. I find when I do that, it, I feel an incredible release, whether it's to myself, other people, you can start off with, you know, minor issues and kind of work your way up. But that, I find that that's a really powerful tool to use. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, for women who are listening, who are have that Chiron in Aries. So again, I think it's, I had writ, written the dates down, but it's basically Gen Xers, right? And then those of us who are sort of a little bit older have um, Chiron in Pisces. Let's start with um, Chiron in Aries. What are the core wounds associated with Chiron and Aries? This placement has to do with vulnerability. And again, I like to really reinforce that spectrum because for, for some of you, it's, it's not a deep, deep wounding. For others, it is vulnerability where you feel really sensitive. You feel like, oh, you know, I want to tread lightly around this area of my value, of my worth, of my self-esteem, of, of how I position myself in the world to be perceived as we all, we all want to be perceived favorably, yet particularly for Chiron and Aries, it's about sourcing love, sourcing value and worth through performance, through really you know, going above and beyond. These are typically women and individuals who are type A personalities, overachievers. You say yes, because you really want to say yes to everything, but it's hard for you when that yes starts to inhibit or affect your personal health, your personal well-being. It's hard for you to go back and say, you know what, that doesn't work for me. I'm not able to do this because you don't want to be perceived as like you can't do something. You don't want to let others down. But over years, over time, you're really depleting your own well and your own resources, be it financially, emotionally. So it's really about learning. Specifically, I give some takeaway steps for every placement of Chiron. When you're asked to do something, even if you know if it's a yes, learn to say, you know what, that sounds great. Let me get back to you. And you work in a buffer of time to really sit back and see if this works. And then you allow yourself, you start practicing when something doesn't work for you to say, you know what, I thought I was able to do that, but I'm not. And I bet you that 10 out of 10 times people are going to understand. It's just your own judgment of yourself, believing that they won't, or you're somehow going to be perceived as being flaky. But if you don't address this underlying issue of of really monitoring your own value and worth and what works for you to show up, you will end up being flaky because you'll get to that breaking point where you just snap and you can't take anymore. And, you know, so it's really about staying out ahead of things and being mindful of what you can give to others and what you need to give to yourself. And again, if you're listening, the Chiron in Aries is April, 1968 to June, 1976. And what I find when I'm working with women in this, who have the Chiron in Aries, or even those of those of them, those clients who don't, is that when we don't have a high level of self worth, what ends up happening is we, we fill up our backpack with this not enoughness and we end up carrying that into our future. And that's what shows up. You know, we keep running on this treadmill thinking, well, I'll do more, then I'll have more and I'll feel okay. But we never get there until we are able to really, you know, heal this core wound. When actually by stopping and, and, you know, stopping the people pleasing, mm -hmm. stopping the overworking and learning that by saying no, you know, to those outside things and saying yes to your inward health and well-being and doing less, having more fun, you know, going to play pleasure, lots of pleasure, lots of spaciousness in your schedule. That's how you really start to heal this placement where you you schedule things that feel really fun and delightful that are separate from work. That's really key. So let's move a little bit into uh, Chiron and Pisces, which is where I have my placement. Tell us a little bit about that core wound and how we can heal and transform. So Chiron in Pisces has to do with a vulnerability up to and including a core wounding in your sense and ability to care for yourself and your connection to the immaterial world, spirituality, however you define that. 
be it through religion, um, through meditation, through prayer, through nature. And Mother Teresa had her Chiron in Pisces, and she's a wonderful example of how she learned to give so much, but also maintain her own health and well-being, to have that balance. So it's really about you learning to prioritize your physical health, your emotional health, putting on your own oxygen mask first, like they say on every flight, before the flight takes off, before you put the mask on children, which sounds weird and counterintuitive, but it's so important to truly care from yourself. So you're giving from overflow or even neutrality versus your depletion, or else you can experience health issues and emotional and emotional problems. Well, I find the biggest issue that women have with the self-care piece, and it sounds like it's both both placements, the, the Chiron and Pisces and the Chiron areas have some of that, you know, the need for self-care and the difficulty with that. But I find when sometimes when women start to do it, they feel so much guilt, right? They feel like put, when they put themselves first, all of this guilt comes up because they've been told that they're supposed to put everybody else first. Do you have any thoughts in terms of how women can let go of the guilt and really give themselves the pleasure, the self-care, create those boundaries and feel good about it instead of guilty? Yes. I tell my clients, Dr. Ellen, that you can feel guilty. You can feel these all of these emotions and do it anyway. That's what courage is. We're just holding this awareness of I'm feeling guilty as I say no. I'm feeling guilty as I don't do that. And it's okay. You can feel guilty. You can feel all of this and also stay committed to yourself. And over time, the, the guilt or the shame even starts to dissipate. That's what courage is. Doing things that scare you, that are uncomfortable, and yet you walk through it anyway. Yeah, that is a great tip. I tell my clients to understand that guilt is not productive in that situation because you can't give from an empty cup. You need to be giving from overflow. And then when we give ourselves a self-care, when we set boundaries, we have so much energy for everything and everyone else in our lives. So I'm curious, um, do you heal the core wounding once and for all when you do the forgiveness, when you set those boundaries, when you say no, when you feel that you really are enough, you feel and value yourself, are you done with the healing or is this something that continues throughout the lifespan? What's a helpful visual to answer that question for me, Dr. Ellen? It's like the volume on a stereo on your radio that it might be really loud right now with these pain point experiences, but through this healing journey, the volume, you turn it down. And certainly there are moments when it's at a zero and you feel really wonderful and happy. And then there'll be little triggers that happen and the volume spikes up for a moment. So it's definitely a lifelong path of attending to these parts of yourself and attending to those parts of others in your life that you love and care about and journeying together to be gentle and mindful of these areas of vulnerability so that we're practicing, you know, mindful, careful, deactivating and loving self-care and loving others. It's definitely a process that is lifelong. Yeah. And that word mindfulness comes up. I don't think I've done an interview yet where we haven't brought in this mindfulness where you bring in that observer, where you see yourself saying yes, when you mean no, you, you start to notice when you feel guilty with the self-care and you, you know, become mindful of your desire and need to heal. So awesome information where you are going to take a break. And then when we come back, we are going to be talking to Angel Hartwell all about really how to heal money wounds and really step into your power in terms of wealth. You're listening to Rock Your Midlife. If you'd like to get in touch with me, head on over to the midlifewhisperer.com. That's the midlifewhisperer.com. We'll see you in a couple minutes. You're clear. All right. That was awesome, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. Complex stuff. Yes. So when we come back, I'm going to have Angel ask you a question. Angel, do you have a question for Lisa? You don't have to say it now, but ask well, Lisa 6, a question. 6,000, of course. 6,000 <laughs> 6, <laughs> questions for Lisa. We don't have time for all the questions. So we I will formulate a question. I am sure it will land exactly on time. Yeah. How is the book doing? And how are you doing too? I know you, you lost your cat a week ago. And that's really hard. Thank you. You know, it's a process. I had a cat. Angel for 17 years. He was like my best friend and unexpectedly transitioned to heaven uh, like in a day. It was very unexpected, his illness. And so I'm I'm on the healing journey. I'm definitely, you know, a day at a time, but yeah, it's my, better. 
my kitty i had to say goodbye to i am so sorry the king of all cats i had to say goodbye to him and uh literally left to go to a live event and three days later corona shut everything down so oh gosh yeah it was uh it was it's it's uh you know when you have a medicine animal yes that's it angel yes he was a shaman a healer i've had clients totally. i haven't seen in 10 years send emails because they saw the post on linkedin i yeah. just want to thank you and jiggy he helped you know he'd crawl in their lap in the perfect moment or just sit next to them he was so intuitive yes yeah a healer yeah totally yeah i had one of those she would just um put her hands wherever she did Reiki, oh, you know, she would yeah. just be like, okay. That's amazing. I would, I would have him come and he would, I'd be working with a client and he'd come and get right into my lap or he'd be like, Angel, like, yes. my face, oh, but, or yes. like, you know, he, he, or he, sometimes he would like need my stomach and it would yes. be like, okay, what's going on in your stomach? Shall we talk about that? <laughs> yeah. He was, he was quite the, uh, quite the magical being. And yes. I have, I have, um, chosen not to to uh welcome another medicine cat mm. into my life at this point yeah yeah I yeah. Hear you. yeah i'm i'm not uh not going in that direction at this point but it was a powerful a powerful allyship yeah so i am sending condolences to you lisa as you navigate that thank you i have a yeah. second little calico you might have seen in the back i did i saw the yeah. calico. and she loved him she loved jiggy was his name with the j so much so i feel as well just her and i for now like re-establishing this new yeah. baseline we are coming back yeah right. and ellen you're gonna have me ask her a question and yes then and then we'll go it. we'll have your interview you are listening to rock your midlife with dr ellen the midlife whisperer have a question for dr ellen or her guests Join us on the show at 866-472-5788. That's 866-472-5788. Now back to the show. Here again is Dr. Ellen, the Midlife Whisperer. Welcome back to Rock Your Midlife. So excited that you are here today. We are talking all about healing. We're going to shift gears in a moment from talking about healing our core wounds to healing our relationship with money because we have the amazing Angel B. Hartwell, and she is an internationally recognized speaker, transformation artist, Be the Change Movement to Watch, and Quilly Award winner. And she is one of America's premier experts. She is an executive producer and host of the award-winning Wickedly Smart Women podcast. I was on her podcast. It was a blast. It's phenomenal. And she is also author of the number one new release, Be Heard by Millions and Live Your Destiny. And she's going to share how we can heal our money wounds and welcome wealth in instead. But before we get to Angel and healing our money wounds, I'd love for Angel to ask Lisa to hear a question. Uh, yes. Yeah, so Lisa, thank you, first of all, so much, uh, Dr. Ellen, for having me and giving me the opportunity to steep in Lisa's magic today. I think the main question that comes for me, because we've been talking both about Chiron and Pisces and Chiron and Aries, both of them, it seems to me, there is an element around actually um, speaking what you require. Um, and I'm curious, like, how do you help your clients to also open up their capacity to speak? Because I, I feel like that's a piece that gets suppressed, repressed, and depressed specifically for women. Angel, that's a really um, nuanced question, which I appreciate. And it's so wonderful to meet you today here on Dr. Ellen's show. I love your vibe and energy. And I would say to that, it's something I have worked on myself, how to speak my truth with love and authenticity without watering down so much like I used to do. And I think it's an, it's an art and a practice combined because I haven't done it perfectly. And so with my clients as well, I encourage them to use me as a, as a touchstone. Like, what would you like to say to this person? And we kind of work it through together. What would you want to say from your gut? So I would encourage you say from your gut in your journal, like just write it out uninhibited curse words, whatever you need to say. And you start editing down from there to work this through within yourself. I'm a big 
practitioner and practicer of before you send a text that's sensitive, text yourself, send the whole thing to yourself and edit it in your own, you know, so it's only to you because often what you send first isn't really what you truly want to say from that from that heart centered space and edit from there. I think it can really be important to take some time to sit with what you'd wanna to say to someone, especially when it's charged with a lot of your emotion, your passion, your deep desire to be understood. So those are the, some of the ways that I, I work with others and myself. Those are fabulous hints and ideas. I know, write it out first. And I think, you know, as women, that's something we really need to lean into is that we get to speak and we get to say no when we need to say no and yes when we need to say yes. So thank you, Lisa. Let's switch gears and talk a little bit about wealth. I am so curious, Angel, how you became the Wealthy Life Mentor. What made you create a business around that? And tell us a little bit about your background and how you got to this place. Well, before I do that, I also have to echo Lisa's uh, words that she said at the beginning. I just want to honor you, Dr. Ellen, for how you are holding yourself and how you are um, really standing in the spotlight and speaking into your reality, how you're going to navigate this journey of yours that you are on. And so to answer the question about how I became a the wealthy life mentor is it was my own journey. I had to take my own journey to discovering what a wealthy life meant for me. So I want to start by really defining wealth and wealth is actually much more than money. It is the sum total of all of the resources that we have available to us. And that includes, um, I, I actually like to use the word thief, T-H-I-E-F, and you can write that down if you're listening, T-H-I-E-F. So the sum total of all the resources that we have available to us, our time, our health, our imagination, which is the combination of our intellect and our intuition, it's the unity of those two, and then the ecosystem of exchange that we are a part of and that we continue to build and grow, that ecosystem of exchange is where the money piece happens. And you'll notice it's only 20% of this sum total of all of the wealth. And then the F is fun with our friends, our family, and our fellows on the journey. And fun are the first three letters of the word funds as well. I like to oh. point that out. <laughs> That is so cool. What an incredible way to look at wealth, because I think when people focus just on the money aspect and then they maybe get the money or they're trying, I always tell people, don't focus on getting out of debt because you're just going to attract more debt, focus on financial freedom or, but what a cool way to look at wealth. Thank you for that. You're welcome. And, and, you know, it is true in our culture that we have focused the idea of wealth on just the amount of money that people have. And I am here to disrupt that because we have heard many, many stories, both of men and of women who have, you know, achieved massive amounts of financial success. And then the next day they're, you know, completely incapacitated because they burnt their health or um, they have no family, friends or fun in their life. So, you know, even if we look at popular culture, like the, the movie, um, The Devil Wears Prada is a great example of this archetype, this stereotype that's been projected, particularly I think on women from the Chiron in Pisces generation, uh, which I happen to be from the Chiron and Pisces generation. And that generation, we were actually programmed with two competing messages. So as a child in my younger years, and I'm sure this is probably the same for you, our parents were um, part of the generation where it was the volunteer, like the women held together the fabric of society. And if you didn't volunteer, then there was something wrong with you. I mean, like you were a working woman or you weren't at home taking care of your kids or volunteering to take care of everybody else, right? Um, and then there was our, our generation came in at this tipping point where we were also programmed with the Anjali commercial. Yeah. Right. You can bring home the bacon, fry it up in the pan and never let him forget he's a man because you're a woman. And so um, we definitely, this particular generation, I think, has a lot of unpacking of 
socialization to do in order to get to our sovereignty and to create the wealthy life that is ours to live and that we get to design. Yeah, that's really powerful. I've just, you've been reading Michelle Obama's autobiography and how she is trying to, which part of her wants to be like her mom, who was a stay-at-home mom and took care of the kids. But then of course she wants to be this high powered career woman. And the thing is we can't do it all. And then we forget the wonderful anacronym that you just gave you know, thief of what is truly going to make us happy. And I always, I was kind of like, and what are we work. stealing from? What are right. we stealing from? Yeah. It's like, we're clawing it's... up this ladder of success, but it's up against the wrong building. We get to the top and it's like, why am I not happy? So let's talk about the um, five ways that we ward off wealth. Can you share those? Sure. Yeah. So the five ways that we ward off wealth and Often these are inherited, they come from social conditioning or cultural conditioning, they come from, you know, the education system that we got, they come from our parental uh, attitudes, maybe wounds that we had in childhood. Uh, the five ways, the first way that we ward off wealth is worry. And when I'm working with my clients, I see worry. I'm a seer. I can perceive. And when I see worry in people, what I see is I see a musty, smelly, moldy old army blanket that's wrapped around whatever we are worrying about. So if we're worrying about our health, that's what is the energy that we are projecting onto our health. If we're worried about money, that's the energy that we're wrapping around money. Well, you know, money is going to run for screaming from that, right? Uh, and so worry is the first. And often it comes from our mother line. Our, it's, it is passed down from mother to child, mother to child, mother to child, and it looks like these mummy wrappings. So the first one is worry, and we want to uh, get ourselves out of that encasement of worry, because when we are in that, it's incredibly repellent to any aspect of a wealthy life. We're you know, worried we're going to run out of time, or we're worried we're going to have no money, or we're worried we're not going to be healthy, or whatever. It's actually creating that reality for us. Well, it's like praying um, for what you don't want to happen. Correct. That's and I'll is. never forget the first time that I really got this. The first time I really got this summer of 2004, it's hot. I'm out in the backyard mowing my lawn and I have not had any income for like two years because I left behind the real estate career that I had for 20 years. And I am now starting to worry because I've been using credit and borrowing against my house and doing all this self-education, which is part of my midlife transition. I actually had to make the choices to invest in myself, including the time. And here I am out in the backyard and I run over the bolt that falls off the, the lawnmower. <sighs> the next day I go to teach my first crystal healing course. I made $40 that night, came home. The babysitter had put the pop popcorn in upside down and burnt a hole right through my microwave. And then the day after that, I got a call that I needed four new tires on my car. And that was like three times, three days in a row. I was like, whoa, all of this worry is creating. It's creating. Our thoughts are creative. Our emotions are creative. So worry so is one. one. Yeah. What's two? So um, number two is when we waffle, when we waffle and we're unable to make a decision. And so what that looks like is let's say, for example, that there's somebody who is at a live event and they are thinking about starting their business and the person on stage makes an offer of $10,000 to help you get your entrepreneurship off the ground. And you take a break, you go to the bathroom, your best friend calls and says, oh my God, that Mediterranean vacation that we've been looking at forever, it's on sale for $10,000. So now you have the cruise ship or the entrepreneurship, cruise ship entrepreneurship, cruise ship, entrepreneurship, cruise ship, entrepreneurship, and you can't make a decision, you don't make a decision, and both ships sail. So waffling is going to ward off a wealthy life, because if you're indecisive, you're basically telling the universe, I don't know what I want, I'll take whatever, right? I'll take whatever. And so you end up with a whatever life, you don't end up with a wealthy life that you have consciously chosen to create and you have designed. Um, the third way that we ward off wealth is withdrawing. So if you're investing your energy, your time, your commitment into maybe creating a business or um, you know, creating a healthier 
life for yourself that's going to be um, have your body be more stronger or whatever. And then you get going down that path. And then all of a sudden something shifts and you start to pull your energy back from that. And so when you withdraw your energy, there's no, there's no power there anymore to, to bring that into life, to bring whatever it was that you were focusing on into life, whether it's more fun or whether it's more, um, you know, building out your ecosystem of exchange or whether it's working with your intuitive knowing when you pull back, then there's, there's no connection. And because there's no connection, there can't be any creation. So that's the third way that we ward off wealth. And I would let people know too, that you have a quiz too. Can yes. you tell people where they can grab your quiz so they can find out yes, what their specific at. issue, where they're at? Yeah. So the quiz you can find at quiz.wealthylifementor.com. That's quiz.wealthylifementor.com. And when you take the quiz, it takes like seven or eight seconds. <laughs> like it's like eight questions. It's not a long quiz, but it will give you the areas where, you know, it will give you a grade basically on how, uh, how well you are ready to receive wealth. Like, are you ready to welcome wealth? What's your readiness for welcoming a wealthy life by design. And so it will score you uh, based on all five of the ways that we ward off wealth. And you'll get that information as soon as you take the quiz. Okay, so we have, let's see, worry, we have waffling, we have, was it warding off? Withdrawing. Withdrawing, and what's yeah. four and five? Four and five, wine is, is one of them. Wine, when We're okay. whining. So when we're whining, and generally it's over wine, when we're whining, we are actually... Uh, energizing, we're complaining, we're bitching and moaning about a specific circumstance, and we're getting others to collude with us about their circum this particular circumstance. Generally, when we're whining, we're, we're bitching and moaning and complaining about something that we think is wrong. Okay. Now you are a beautiful example of the opposite of this, Dr. Ellen, because you have asked all, both of us to collude with your vision for perfect health, right? And so as you can see, when you're whining, generally over wine, all you're doing is energizing what you don't want. And you're actually inviting in more people to energize what you don't want. Now, is there a place for people to talk about what's not working? Absolutely. The place for you to talk about what's not working is with your therapist. The place for you to talk about what's not working is in a container with your coach or your mentor or your guide that you're working with, that you've invested with to get help on this particular situation. There are containers for you to bring everything that is going on. If you're feeling sad, if you're angry, if you're upset or whatever, but it's not whining over wine because when you whining over wine, all you're doing is engaging and enrolling other people to affirm your challenges rather than support your victory. And it's so interesting too. It goes back to what I was saying at the beginning of the show about habits. We are so in the habit of worrying and that's just neuroscience. Our brains are designed to constantly scan the environment for what's wrong and worry about things. And this complaining, it's sometimes a way that we connect with others, but we really need to work on, if we want to heal and we want to live a wealthy life, to work on ending our constantly complaining. I've done, I do often with my clients, like a 30 day, no complaint challenge. Like you have mm -hmm. to go 30 days without complaining. And if you complain, then you got to start all over again. But I love holding container because there is a place where you need to sort of see what's not working and deal with difficult emotions. We're not talking about toxic positivity here where everything is great all the time because it's not. Believe me, I have my moments where the tears are coming and I'm like, mm -hmm. this sucks, I hate this. But then you have to pick yourself up and say, okay, what are, how are we going to make lemonade out of this? So what's number five, the, the fifth so way that we ward off wealth? Number five goes back to our volunteer mentality, and that is waiting on, okay? So waiting mm -hmm. on is different than being patient. Waiting on is, uh, it shows up in one of two ways and sometimes both. It's waiting on the handsome prince to come along and rescue you, right? Or the, you know, outside force to come along and rescue you, and you're just waiting on them, and there's no energy in you other than this energy of I'm desperate, I'm sitting here alone, I don't know when it's going to happen, but I'm waiting on it. It's like my day will come someday.
but you're not taking any action. You're just in this passive mode. The other way that waiting on shows up is when you're waiting on everybody else, like you're taking, you're caretaking everyone else. And, and this happens so often. I see it so often in like mastermind groups or group training programs. There's always Susie Sunshine who's helping everybody else out. And at the end, and I'll raise my hand because I did this. At the end, she's the one with the short end of the stick because she used all her time, energy, attention, focused on taking care of everybody else's problems to the detriment of her own. Which goes back to what Lisa was saying about Chiron, right? And how we're always putting ourselves last. We're being people pleasers. We're you know putting ourselves in, in, in the back of the bus. So now that we've talked about the ways we ward off wealth, and I, I'd love to hear, we'll have to have coffee sometime and talk about how these ideas come to you because I love all of your anachronisms and uh, your <laughs> alliteration. But how do we welcome wealth instead? Well, um, there are actually five antidotes to each of these, and you'll get more information about how you can access that when you take the quiz, but I want to um, help people with at least the first one. And so uh, the first thing that we have to do is we have to restore, cultivate, and practice our sense of wonder. Getting back to that childlike uh, experimental curiosity that says, I wonder, like, I wonder what would happen if I took my to-do list and took 20 of the 21 things off of it. I wonder what would happen if instead of, you know, adding six more speaking gigs, I put into those spaces, time out in nature. I wonder what would happen if instead of waffling about the cruise ship or the entrepreneurship, I just made a decision. I wonder what would happen. And so wonder is the first step in cultivating that sense of joyous curiosity, exploration, experimentation, giving ourselves permission to get back to the, uh, as Robert Holden calls it in his book, Lovability, the unconditioned self getting back to that unconditioned self and using wonder as our compass for how we're going to channel our energy so that we can create a wealthy life by design that works for us as an individual. Self-care is actually something that can happen only when we're choosing to be sovereign. And I think that self-care is like a power tool to, uh, uh, that we have been given the opportunity to work with to disrupt and dismantle industrialized society's belief that we have to be always busy. I say, don't be seduced by the culture of busy because it's going to kill you. Yeah, it's so true. We were talking before the show started about how COVID gave us all this pause. I remember the first happened, there was sort of this peacefulness about it. And a lot of people thinking, wow, I'm spending time with my family and people were spending time doing those art projects. I would have clients who took out those paints that they bought years ago or started journaling or brought out a musical instrument. And then we just got back because our, our culture is so much about constantly doing and not being, but I love this idea of wonder, you know, wonder, curiosity of just asking hmm, what would happen if I step back, what would happen if I order takeout tonight instead of having dinner, or if I didn't clean the house, or if I, you know, took something off my plate? It's fabulous. So I want to let people know, and I'm going to bring Lisa back and ask you a question. But again, the quiz again, Angel, where people can find it's quiz. Can take this. It's quiz dot wealthy life mentor dot com. Quiz, quiz dot wealthy life mentor dot com. Okay, quiz.wealthylifementor.com. And a lot of people know too, the book is The Chiron Effect too. If you're looking to get it, it is absolutely fabulous. I'm gonna bring Lisa back. Lisa, do you have a question for Angel? Angel, I do. And I'm so curious, do you think that there's a correlation between our dominant attachment style, be it secure, avoidant, or anxious, and the way we have that relationship to wealth? Do you think there's... 
Oh, I, th- I would agree with that a thousand percent. And I've been doing a lot of work myself in my own history. There's a lot of abuse and anxiety. And part of the way that I was able to evolve myself and begin to build my own wealthy life by design was I actually had to uproot myself from the toxic soil of abuse first. And now I'm actually in the, the process myself personally of uprooting myself from the toxic soil of anxiety. I love that. Thank you. Yeah, powerful. And, just to, and to close too, I can understand, Angela and I have been having this conversation about mushrooms because we're both lovers of mushrooms, but isn't that like the truth of mushrooms, right? They grow in the, the dirt and the things that are rotting. And I love that you're taking sort of the difficulties of your life and transforming them. Thank you both so much for joining me today. This has just been such a treat to have both of you meet each other and have this conversation. Thank you all for listening. If you want to connect with me, it's the midlifewhisperer.com. That's the midlifewhisperer.com. And you can connect with Angel. Where, Angel, your website? quick quickly. wealthy life mentor.com and lisa nola therapy.com new orleans los angeles therapy.com all right thank you so much women this has been such a treat thank you again for listening and we'll see you next week on rock your midlife all right you're clear thank you all right you all have a wonderful week we'll talk to you next time thank thanks you very josh much. thank you thank you <laughs>